you're our vocal. Amen. So anyway, praise God. We're excited about all that the Lord is doing here. Tonight, I'd like to give you an opportunity to give and to be a part of this. There are expenses to putting on a conference and all of the things that we do. And this is an opportunity for you to be a part of what's happening. And I tell you, when you sow into a ministry, uh, you become a partaker of everything that's happening. And I wish I had time to tell you everything that God is doing here, but I don't know everything. We just had a board meeting. Dwayne was there at the board meeting and I learned a lot about what we're doing. I know some people don't understand that, but what how, do you remember? It was hundreds of projects we have going. I forgot how many, but it was hundreds. And here, how much? It's over the top. Over the top. And I mean, it is amazing. We just interviewed Julie Mapitano yesterday on my inside story. And she is affecting thousands of people in the Congo and things are changing and we're a part of that. And we support 144 ministries, I think it is, on top of everything we're doing. So anyway, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give. Let me just share this verse with you out of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. It says, for thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Are, are our ushers passing out these envelopes? If they haven't already done that, go ahead and pass these envelopes down the aisle. This is for cash giving. You can put your name and address on there in English, not in tongues, and we will give you a receipt. But you know what this is saying? If you were to read this whole uh, passage in context, this is Moses speaking. One of the very last things that he said to the Israelites and basically the whole book of Deuteronomy is just one day or maybe two days that Moses was rehearsing everything that God had done and warning the Israelites as you go into the promised land, here's what you need to remember. And what he's saying here is, he says, when you enter into the promised land and you enter into these giants house that you didn't build, you know, if they would have, they were bothered about the giants being in the land, but man, the giants in the land, that was awesome because that means they built big houses and they were able to inhabit their big houses. If they'd have killed all of the dwarfs, they'd have had to rebuild all of the houses. And he says, when you enter into these houses that you've not built, if you go into these fields that you didn't have to cultivate, you don't have to put up the fencing, it's already done. When you get all of this prosperity, Remember that it wasn't your might that did this, that it's God that gave you all of those things. And then he says, you shall remember it was the Lord your God who gave you power to get wealth. And the reason he gave you this power is so that he might establish his covenant. The reason God blesses us is so that we can be a blessing. And I think many times people lose sight of this and they think God blesses me so that I can have all of this stuff. Don't get me wrong. God doesn't mind us having stuff. God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. So I don't believe that you have to live a poor life, but your emphasis has to be on being a blessing, giving and not just receiving. The reason we give is so that we can be a blessing to other people. And it's true that when you give, you do have it returned unto you and you need to believe for that so that you can give again. So I'm not saying that we don't believe for a return, but the, there is more joy in giving than there is in receiving. And understanding and remembering that it's God who gave us this power. If you would stop and think about it, we live in one of the most prosperous nations on the planet. You know, I've heard statistics that may, I may not get this exactly right, but they talk about China being the second largest economy in the world. And China has what? Billions of people. We have around 320, 330 million. And yet we are 20 times larger than the economy of China. And that's the second largest economy. And if you start, you know, uh, California has a larger economy than hundreds of nations in the world. Where did this prosperity come from? You didn't cause it. We were born into this nation. Our forefathers fought. God's blessing is on this nation. 
And we need to recognize that this isn't our great wisdom and it's not because America is the greatest place. Man, we've got our faults just like anybody else. This is the blessing of God that has given us this prosperity. And you don't need to look at it as this is my prosperity. God's the one who caused you to be born in this nation. God's the one who gave you your talents. You can develop a talent, but you can't put in what God left out. And God is the one who gave you your talents, your abilities, this opportunity that we have and all of these things. It's God who gave you power to get wealth. God doesn't give you wealth. That's not what it says. He gives you power to get wealth. There is an anointing to get wealth. And this nation has been blessed with wealth. We are approximately 4% of the world's population and we have 90% of the wealth in the world. This is God. And why did he do it? So you can just consume it upon yourself. The American dream, get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on your can. That's what a lot of people think that it's all about. But no, it's so that you could establish his covenant so that we could give. We still are the largest nation in the world that gives towards missions. We help more people than any other place on this planet. But this is why God has blessed us. And so as we receive an offering tonight, I just want to remind you that God blessed you to make you a blessing. And don't forget that. If you ever forget that and you start building a dam to keep this power to get wealth for yourself, and if, and if it all becomes about you, then you become stagnant when you build a dam. But if you will just allow it to flow through like a river, one hand to receive and one hand to give, as the money flows through, there'll always be plenty for you. You need to become a uh, river of God's blessing instead of building a dam and trying to hoard it for yourself. When you try and save everything for yourself, it actually hinders your own prosperity. So I just want to share that with you as we give. And I want to encourage you to be generous. There's so much that we're doing. Man, we, we just had some meetings this afternoon about getting our garage paid off. And I met with the architectures to start building our student housing. And we were talking about our... Our student activity center, which could be 200,000 square feet. And we got a lot to do. I got about $150 million worth of buildings on the inside of me yet. So unless you give more than that, I can spend it quickly. <laughs> Amen. So Father, we thank you for these truths. Thank you for blessing this nation. Thank you for blessing us as people. Father, thank you for the way that you have given us opportunities that most people who have lived on this planet have never had. Thank you for the level of prosperity that we have. And Father, I just pray that you touch people's hearts and let them realize that the reason you have blessed us is to make us a blessing so that you could establish your covenant so that we could reach people and change people's hearts. And so, Father, as people give tonight, I pray the word of God that you give back unto them good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, that they get a hundredfold return in this life. And we thank you and agree and receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. You know, Deb was talking about that tomorrow they're going to have uh, some things. Is this downstairs in the lower level? Do we have that up now or is it tomorrow? Okay, so tomorrow we're going to have like the Chamber of Commerce here. We'll have realtors here. We'll have uh, all kinds of people that are looking for employees and stuff. And so if you're interested, if you're thinking about moving here and you want to know about real estate, if you want to know about jobs that are available and stuff downstairs in the barn, we will have all of that. And that is really a good thing just to help you get a feel for what's going on. Amen. And I believe it'll be a, a blessing to you. We want to help you. And we have things here in the school. We don't have student housing yet. That's something I'm working on. And we, like I said, had a meeting today about building our first student housing thing. Uh, but we, we are doing what we can to help you. There are people, I met one uh, couple that uh, bought a house here just so that they could have students in. And I think they have six or seven ladies that are in there 
house and they, they built it just for student housing. And we have a lot of things like that. So we will help make connections for you and do all of those things. And so we will help you and make sure you take advantage of those opportunities tomorrow afternoon. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter three. And I want to continue to talk about what I was talking about this morning. And again, I want to say that our world today, it's a, it's a battle between light and dark. It's a battle between truth and lies. It's not about conservative, liberal. It's not about race. It's not about economics. It's all about the truth that is revealed through God's word. And Satan is the father of all lies. We use that verse this morning in John chapter eight, verse 44. And Satan is just trying to come against everything that the Bible stands for, everything that is good. And that's really what this battle is all about. And that is why it is absolutely imperative that you learn the truth. You cannot be a true disciple of the Lord without knowing the truth. And this word is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so this is what our Bible college is all about, is about sharing the truth of God's word that sets people free. And I just want to go back to the beginning and show you this. You know, there, one of the things I've learned in studying the word is go back to the book of Genesis, find the first time that people sinned, see how it happened. And you know what? Satan is doing the same thing today. He doesn't have any new tricks. He doesn't have any new things. People love to say, well, we have pressures and problems that nobody has ever happened, had before. And what they're trying to do is to say that the things that have worked for people in the past won't work for us. We're unique. And yet the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. The same thing that everybody else deals with. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. There is nothing new. And anytime you think that your situation is different, it's worse than anybody else. You have just exempted yourself from the promises of God because your situation is unique. And so what works for me, what works for other people won't work for you. That's a ploy of the devil. So I've learned that when you uh, have a problem, go back and find the first person who ever connected with God and how did God deal with them? How was it that Satan came and did things? And you'll find out that he's doing the same thing. He just puts a different wrapper on it, puts a different bow on it and tries to make you think your situation is unique, but it's not. And you know, this is one of the reasons I love the testimonies that we have. We have a lot of testimonies. Go to our website if you haven't been there and we have great testimonies. We've got over 200,000 hours of free material on our website. If you listen 24 hours a day, it'll take you, what, 22 years to go through it. If you listen eight hours a day, this is free material. It would take you 64 years or something to go through it. But we got plenty of stuff there and we've got testimonies. And one of the reasons I love testimonies is because you think that nobody's ever had your problem and then you hear somebody else and you see that, man, my problem is minor compared to theirs. And if they believed God and it worked for them, it'll work for me. So I say all of those things to say, let's go back and look how Satan came against Adam and Eve and got them to leave perfection. You know, if you stop and think about this, it's amazing that Satan was able to pull this off because all of us have lived in a fallen world. We've been exposed to a lot of hurt and pain. Many of us have been abused and there's just rejection and there's hurt and there's all kinds of things. And so in a sense, we have excuse for being a jerk. But Adam and Eve were living in perfection. God had never done anything bad. There was nothing wrong. How do you get people that have never been hurt, never been sad? They never had missed a meal. They never had anything missing. They couldn't look back and say, well, I was abused as a kid and I've been hurt. And they had no gripes. They lived in a perfect climate. They didn't have to believe for cars. They didn't have to believe for houses. They didn't have to believe for clothes. Everything was perfect. How do you get perfect people to leave perfection and accept 
corruption. That's a big task. How did Satan pull this off? Look here in Genesis chapter three and verse one. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And I have meditated on these verses literally tens of thousands of hours. I could, I have already preached hours on nearly every word in this. So I'm going through and just hitting some of the highlights. But notice that the serpent was the most subtle animal. That means the most sly, cunning, crafty, deceptive animal that God had created. Why did God, why did Satan choose the serpent? Why didn't he choose an elephant to just put his foot on her head and say, go eat of the fruit or I'll smush you like a melon? (laughs) Why didn't he use a lion or some animal to intimidate them with fear? It's because he had no power to make them do anything. He was the anointed cherub that covered Isaiah chapter 14 and he was there to minister to the people of God, not to... Man, I've got a great teaching on this. I haven't got time to go into that. So I'm going to pull a Dwayne and say, don't go there, Andrew. Get my teaching on uh, the true nature of God. It'll really bless you. But the reason he chose this animal is because he had no power to force them to do anything. His only power is lies and deception. He is the father of all lies. Every lie that has ever been spoken was because that person had intercourse with the devil. The devil is the one that birthed that lie. You need to remember that anytime you go to stretching the truth, that you're flirting with the devil. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not bear false witness. It didn't say you shall not lie. Of course, lying is bearing false witness, but false witness, you could be saying the truth and yet not present the truth. You could be just sharing certain information. Uh, Man, I don't want to go there. I could give you some great examples of things that have happened this week by our president and by people that they are saying some things that it may be partially factual, but they're taking it out of context. It's false witness. And it was the devil that birthed that in them. It's lies. Satan doesn't have the power to force you to do anything. He can't do anything to us without our consent and cooperation. This is why you know the truth and the truth makes you free because the moment you understand the truth, deception is gone. You know, Congressman Bob McEwen made this point and I thought it was just a great illustration. But if you were to guess how wide this stage is. I could tell you exactly how wide this stage is because I designed it. And I can tell you exactly how many feet it is. But you know, if I was to start asking you, some people would say 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. We'd have all kinds of different things and what makes one opinion better than the other. You could sit there and argue over it and talk about it and say, no, I, I really believe it's 60 feet or whatever. All you have to do is get a tape measure and measure it. And once the facts are known, it just automatically invalidates all of the lies, all of the guesses. And you know what? Today, people are doing away with the standard, the truth, the accuracy, and they're thinking, well, I believe that it's up to the person to choose whether they're a male or a female. I believe that, you know, we can do this and that. And they just have these opinions. And the reason they hate the word of God, the reason they are trying to get it out of the schools and they're trying to make all Christians withdraw into their four walls of their facility and get out of the public square. And you have no right. We had a congressman a month ago and and somebody stood up and quoted the Bible and he interrupted them and says, the Bible has no place in this Congress. That is blasphemy. This nation was founded on the truths of the Bible. And our forefathers says that democracy was, is totally unfit for anybody but a moral people. If America ceases to be more moral, we will destroy ourselves. And there were many comparisons between the French Revolution that was ant, uh, ag- agnostic or, or anti-God versus the American revolution that was birthed on freedom based on scripture and God 
giving us these freedoms. And the French Revolution just killed hundreds of thousands of people in bloodbath. There was one area that they killed over 100,000 people and beheaded them. The guy who came up with the guillotine, his name was something like guillotine. It was, it was some kind of uh, variation of his name. He was beheaded on his own guillotine. And there was people killed by the, by the thousands. It was because they didn't have God in it. And, and our society today is trying to remove God and remove absolute truth and say everything is relative because they, the devil doesn't have power to force anything upon us. He's got to get us away from the truth. The moment the truth is known, deception loses its power. That's why the truth that we know sets us free. So Satan didn't come and try and force them, intimidate them. What he did was come and deceive them and look at how he did it. The very first thing he said unto the woman, man, I could spend some time on this, but I believe that the reason he came to the woman and it says down here in the sixth and the seventh verse that she gave to her husband who was with her. Adam was with her. He was there. So it's not like the woman was tempted without Adam. Adam and Eve were both there. But the reason he came to the woman and said this to the woman is because over in chapter two, verse 17, God told Adam, don't eat of this tree before Eve was taken out of his side. Eve didn't hear these words. Adam is the one that heard these words. And so therefore Satan came to the woman because it was secondhand information to her. And here is a great truth that the word of God has to become real to you. This is where so many people miss it. They go to a church, they hear pastor Dwayne, pastor rich, somebody else. And they are, they're, they're just convinced that what they're saying is right, but you're living off of another person's revelation. And it makes you susceptible to doubt in a way that a person who has had a revelation themselves uh, isn't susceptible. Adam had God speak to him directly and say, in the day that you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. He didn't say you might die. It is a possibility. He says you will die. It was a guarantee but he told Eve about it and therefore Eve, it wasn't her revelation. She was living off of her husband's revelation. You have to receive the revelation for yourself. You know, I minister to a lot of people and we have a lot of people come through here and we have a lot of people that receive the things that we say and it becomes revelation to them and it changes them. But then there's other people sitting right next to them who will hear the exact same words and it doesn't set them free. When I first got into ministry, I thought that if I just presented things properly, everybody would be transformed. And yet I began to see one person would be totally set free and then the next person would fall asleep. And then the one on the other side, like uh, Carrie did today <laughs> during a meeting, I heard about this. And... Uh, <laughs> And then one would fall asleep and then the one on the other side would be just totally set free. And I thought there's no way that the words coming out of my mouth could affect people differently like that. It's not my words that are different. It's the condition of their heart. Some people receive it. Other people don't. So anyway, you have to make the word first person for you. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, I used to go, I was still in the Baptist church and I used to go hear Kenneth Copeland. Once a month, he would hold a, a three day meeting over at Will Rogers auditorium in Fort Worth. And we'd drive about an hour and a half and go hear him. And, um, uh, I would just get fired up, man. I'd hear these things and I'd go back to my Baptist church and preach. And we would see miracles happen. People would be set free. Healings would happen. It would be awesome for the first week, maybe two weeks, but then the third week it would start waning. And by four weeks, I was just saying words and people, it was making no impact on them. And the reason is because I was being criticized. The leaders of the church had come and say, you're preaching heresy. And I just couldn't stand against the criticism and against the persecution. And so I'd go back and hear him the next month and I'd come fired up. And this happened for like a year or more. 
And I would see this pattern so much so that I even began to expect it. I expected that after two weeks, it just wasn't going to have the same impact and I needed to go get another fix. And I was praying, saying, God, what's wrong? And I heard Kenneth Copeland teach on Mark chapter four about the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And the second type of person that heard the word, they received it with gladness. They were excited about it. That was me, but they had no root in themselves. And so endured only for a while and Satan was able to steal it away. And I remember that was a Saturday night. Jamie and I were studying and we heard that and we made a decision and said, never again will I have to quote and say, well, Kenneth Copeland said, or Kenneth Hagin or whoever said, I said, it's going to become my revelation. And if you've listened to me, I don't quote other people a lot. And it's not because I don't receive from other people and don't appreciate what they say. But if I hear somebody say something, I'm going to make it mine. And by the time I get through meditating on it, I forgot who said what. I don't care who I heard it from. It was God that spoke it to me. And so I'll stand up and say what God spoke to me. A lot of people don't personalize the word like that. This is the reason Satan came to the woman and tempted her was because he knew she was more susceptible to doubt because she got it secondhand and it wasn't personal revelation to her. So he came to the woman and he said, hath God said, he challenged the word of God. They could not have sinned. They could not have gotten into disobedience if they would have just stuck with what God said. We were singing this song tonight. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's done. That's the way that we ought to be. And I'm saying this in love, but brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people right here in this auditorium that God said it, you've heard it, but that doesn't settle it. There's a lot of people that honestly aren't absolutely committed to the truth of God's word. And God will tell you something. For instance, we've been encouraging you this whole time to come to Karis Bible College if God is speaking to you. And it just amazes me that people will say, oh yeah, God told me to come, but, and then they'll tell me the problems that they're having, but I've got to sell my house, but am I going to be able to find a job, but it's more expensive to live here than it is where I came from. And they just start listing all of the obstacles that stand in their way. I think I said this in the afternoon session, so not all of you heard this, but we actually had a guy who came and told me that God, he said, I know it beyond a doubt that God told me to come to Karis Bible College, but his family had not heard of me. So they went and asked their pastor, who is this guy? And he said, oh, they're a cult. Stay away from them. So his parents said, don't go. And they said, if you do go, we're going to disinherit you from the family business and you stand to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he had a uh, fiance that they were engaged to be married and she didn't want anything to do with them coming to Colorado and attending school. And she says, I'll break off the engagement if you go. So he was going to lose money. He was going to lose his family. He was going to lose his inheritance. He was going to lose his fiance. And he just started giving me a list of all of the reasons. And after 20 minutes or so, he says, so what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you. If God told you, I believe it. That settles it. Do it. Do it if it hair lips the devil. Do it if it costs you everything you've got. And see, there's a lot of people that, wait a minute. I know God said this, but I'm not sure that I'm going to obey God. I just can't even relate to that. I'm not saying I do everything perfectly, but man, March the 23rd, 1968, I gave up control of my life. And I've done things. God told me to quit secular school that I was in. I lost $350 a month from the government. I lost the acceptance of my family. I got criticized. I got kicked out of church and I got an all expense paid trip to Vietnam <laughs> by doing that. And there was a lot of things. It could have been life and death, but it didn't matter to me. I knew that that's what God told me to do. And I was willing to go to Vietnam and die if that's what God wanted. Amen. There is so much freedom in you not being in control of your life and just saying, Father, what do you want me to do? And if he says, go do this, you just do it. 
We try and rationalize it. You know, Abraham was told by God to leave his father's house and all of his kindred and leave Earl of the Chaldees and come into the land that God had promised him. He didn't obey immediately. He stayed in Haran for, I don't know, an undetermined period of time. And only after his father died, did he come into the promised land. And then he still brought Lot, his nephew with him. And his brother had died. And I believe that he was probably trying to be a good uncle to Lot and thinking about that this guy's fatherless. And so I'm going to help him. And he, he probably had good intentions, but God told him to leave them. And he could have rationalized it and said, but what's going to happen to my nephew if I'm not there to help him? And he needs a father figure. And so he just, for whatever reason, did not obey God and brought Lot with him. Let me ask you how it could have been any worse for Lot if he would have left him in Ur of the Chaldees than what happened to Lot. For those of you who don't know, Lot went into Sodom and Gomorrah and he wound up losing at least two daughters because it says he went out to his daughters that lived in the city and tried to get them to come and they felt like he was mocking and they didn't do it. And so he had at least two daughters plus sons-in-law. He could have had grandkids, we don't know, but at least two daughters that were in Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed in the destruction of it. His wife turned around and looked behind her because she was attached to the daughters, the family, the things in Sodom and Gomorrah, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. And then his two daughters that came out with him thought that every man on the earth had been killed and they said, we're gonna uh, all die. We've gotta have children. They weren't married and so they got their dad drunk and had sex with him and he had two children by incest. How could it have been any worse if Abraham would have just obeyed God and done what he said? And there's people that say, but I've got a, a parent. Well, who's gonna take care of them? Did God tell you to do it? That's the key. That's Did God say to you, if God said it, just salute and say, yes, sir. You might ask, how do I do it? When do I do it? But not, am I going to do it? If God tells you to do something, you just do it. Well, it could kill me. I could be drafted and sent to Vietnam if I do what God told me. You just do it. And you know what? It turned out Vietnam is one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. I was a Baptist when I went to Vietnam. And when I came out, I wasn't. And I didn't mean to change. I didn't try and change. I just spent 10 to 15 hours a day studying the word. And when I came back, the Baptist didn't want me. So anyway, you got to make the word personal. And when God says something to you, you just do it. Eve should have said, look, yes, God said, don't eat of this tree. End of discussion. I'm going to quit talking to you, snake. She let a talking snake talk her into doubting what God said. She could not have sinned if she would have just said, look, God said it. And that's the end of this discussion. First of all, many Christians don't even know what God's word said. You know, I mentioned this this morning, but this whole woke culture where they're tearing down statues and wanting to redo history, there are at least five different times in the word that we are commanded not to remove a landmark. It's a command. You are in sin if you go to tearing down landmarks. Most Christians don't even know that. And so they just watch what's happening and think, well, maybe that's what we should do. If you knew what the truth said, you wouldn't do it. Even if it's bad history, you can learn from it. But most people don't know what the word says. Most people don't understand the principles that are given. Most people don't know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they're tolerating homosexuality. Homosexuality, according to Romans chapter one, is the last stop on the train to being reprobate. You got to get off there. If you go into homosexuality, the next thing is being absolute reprobate to where there is no more any conviction, no more any conscience of sin. That's what the word says. And yet most Christians don't know that. And they think, well, you know, we'll just tolerate this. It's ungodly. You need to love the people. 
I love people. I've had people on staff who've struggled with homosexuality and did some things. And I told them, look, I love you. I'll give you another chance. But if you're going to live this way, you are not going to be an employee. And you know what? They straightened up and they've been an employee with me for over a decade. And so I'm not against people that have struggled with things, but it is wrong. And we've got to stand up. And yet there's a lot of Christians that don't know the word. They don't know what it says. I'm telling you, you've got to know the word. Satan cannot get you into any failure without believing a lie. I'm not sure I'll be able to connect the dots and convince you of this, but you can't get sick without believing a lie. And some of you think, now that's not true. I don't, I didn't do anything to get sick. It just came upon me. That's not true. If you believe the truth, man, I could give you hundreds of scriptures right now that promise you no plague will come nigh your dwelling. Only with your eyes you shall see the reward of the wicked. Exodus chapter 23, I believe it's verse 25, 24, 25, it says, you shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. The word take and away is the Hebrew word that means to turn off. I will turn off sickness on the inside of you. Deuteronomy chapter seven, where we just read Deuteronomy chapter eight during the offering, it says that no plague, no sickness will come upon you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says that every sickness and every disease which is not written here, you are redeemed from those. If you knew the truth of the word of God, then you wouldn't submit to this sickness. But a lot of people think, but I'm only human and cancer is incurable. It's only incurable if you believe what men say. God says all sickness, all disease. There is nothing that will ever be able to stand before you. So whether you understand exactly what I'm saying or not, if you believe the truth of God's word without any reservation, I guarantee you, you could turn off sickness on the inside of you. But a person thinks, but I'm only human. See, that's a lie. You aren't only human. If you're born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, one third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. Amen. You have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. But people will approach God. Oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. The doctor says it's incurable, but I believe you can do all things. Did you know that's all a lie? Somebody says, well, you, you, don't you believe God can do all things? No. God says he will only do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that works in you. God has limited himself to working through people and you have to believe to receive or if you doubt, you do without. It's wrong to say, oh God, you could do anything. If you wanted to, you could just heal me. That's not true. See, you have believed a lie. God has to have a person to flow through. You have to believe in order to receive. So again, whether you totally followed me or not, I'm telling you, you cannot fail without first of all, believing a lie that I'm only human. This is incurable. This is bigger than me. None of those things are true. One person with God is a majority. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If God's telling you to come here and you say, but I, I, I need this, I need money, I need whatever. And see, you're believing a lie. You believe that you have to wait until God removes all of the obstacles before you can obey. Man, if God says something to you, you just do it. You don't care what the results is. You just do it. This makes Christian life so simple. I don't have to sit here and debate it. God, am I going to obey you in this? <laughs> it's never a question with me. Now, again, sometimes I have to pray to make sure, is this really God or is this me? You know, when the Lord told me to 
Uh, I, we were building a building down in Colorado Springs and it was $3.2 million. And at that time, that was like a year's income. And, uh, and he told me to do it debt free. And at the rate we had saved money, I figured it out. It, I would have been over a hundred years old before I'd have gotten that thing done. And so I had to make sure, God, is this really you? Because this was a big decision. And if I said that I'm not going to go into debt and I do this debt free. And if it wasn't God and we just saved money at the rate we'd been going, it would have taken me 40 years or something to get it done. So it was a big decision. And I spent a few days praying until I was assured that it was God. But the moment I knew that this is what God told me to do, I went in and told the manager of our ministry, I said, I'm not taking out a loan. We'd been trying to get a loan for nine months and they just kept saying, no, wait. And then they said, let's start the whole process over. And I said, no way am I going to do that. And so when I, once I knew that the Lord told me to do it debt free, I went in and told the manager, I said, I don't care if they come to us tomorrow and, and offer us all of the $3.2 million dollars I'm not taking it. Guess what? The next day they came and said, you need $4 million. You have been approved. Here's your $4 million. And I told them, you're too late. Amen. And I turned down $4 million. And in 14 months, we had that $3.2 million and we moved into that facility debt free. But see, I, once I know it's God, I'm going to do it. I don't care regardless of whether it looks like it's going to bless me or help me or not. That's what the scripture means when it says in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Many of you are here seeking direction from the Lord. I'm telling you, one of the keys to that is just running up a white flag and surrendering like Carrie was saying today, getting to a place to where God, if you say no, that's fine. You aren't trying to get him to buy into what you want him to do, but you're saying, Father, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. And when you get to that place to where it's not about me, what do you want me to do? And the way you find out what he wants you to do is through the word of God. Uh, Carrie also used that verse in Romans chapter 12, verse two this morning, where it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. The way you find out is to get your mind renewed, transformed, and it's through the word of God that that happens. You have to get to where God's word just becomes absolute in your life. And if it violates our culture, let it violate our culture. If it violates the way that you've been raised, if it doesn't look like it's making sense to you, you just do what God tells you. And again, I could give, I could spend hours tonight giving you testimonies of when God told me to do something like give away all of my materials. Dwayne and I are the only two people I know. I've, I've heard some others since then, but for decades, Dwayne is the only other person I knew on the planet that gave his stuff away. I've given away hundreds of millions of books, CDs, DVDs, and this, that, this isn't including anything on the web. I remember when we started our website, they came and said, are you going to make the web, everything on the web free? You could make a lot of money. And I thought I've given away hundreds of millions of CDs, cassettes and stuff. I said, man, the web, I'm going to just keep doing it. We get millions of downloads every month. I'm not including any of that. I have given away hundreds of millions of books, CDs, DVDs, and materials to people. And when I first did that, everybody told me, you're crazy. I actually had Kenneth Copeland's mother, Vanetta. She was a friend of mine. And she came to me and prophesied one time, thus saith the Lord. Quit giving things away. <laughs> and she made it, thus saith the Lord. And I had to tell her, I said, Vanetta, I love you, but God told me to do this and I am not going to quit doing it. Did you know to the natural mind, that just makes no sense at all. And yet I believe it's one of the keys to God expanding our ministry. 
I have had hundreds, maybe thousands of people tell me the only reason I listened to you is because your stuff was free. (laughs) And that's what got them interested. And and man, as a result, you know, we go, we're on television and uh, my media buyer, he handles over $44 million worth of television time per year for other ministries. And so we had a comparison through these other ministries. And I remember when I went on the church channel, they told me, they said, look, not none of our people that we've put on the church channel have ever gotten over 10 to 12 calls in one day. That's the maximum. It's not going to turn a profit, but to be able to go on TBN, you have to be on the church channel first. And so I said, all right, I'll go on the church channel then. You know, we were getting two and 300 calls a day on the church channel while other people were getting 10. And a lot of it's because my stuff's free. (laughs) But you know what? Boy, once they get it and start listening to it, it has, we were prosper and we're blessed. I'm saying that God will tell you to do things that don't make sense to your mind, but God's smarter than you. I know that's hard for some of you to believe. But God is smarter than you. And just like Carrie was saying this morning, if God tells you no, it's because what you were planning isn't his best. He's got something better for you. He'll never tell you no just to hurt you. And see, this is what Satan did. Hath God said, and she said, well, yes. But she, you could tell she was already entertaining the doubt. And finally, the devil just comes out and he says, you shall not surely die. First of all, he gets you to question the integrity of God's word. Is this really accurate? Is something that was written thousands of years ago still applicable to us today? And I guarantee you, our world today is coming against the standards of the word of God and challenging it. Evolution will challenge the first 11 chapters of the book of the Bible and say, this stuff is crazy. How could a fish swallow a person? They've actually found people inside of fish before. It's a scientific fact, but they will come out and they'll try and get you to challenge all of these things and just plant doubts. And then after you entertain the doubt, they'll just come out and say, that's not accurate. This doesn't apply for us today. I remember uh, uh, Bill Clinton and he was questioned because he claimed to be a Baptist. He claimed to be a born again Christian. And yet he's the one that started the open Uh, transgender, I mean, not transgender, but homosexuality in the uh, military. And he started violating all things. He pushed abortion and on and on. And one of the reporters one time asked him, says, how can you claiming to be a born again Christian do these things that are contrary to the Bible? And I heard him say this. He says, the Bible was written by men and it was applicable for their day. But you have to interpret in the light of our society. And basically you cannot go by what the Bible said. This applied to people back then, but those things don't apply to us today. Did you know there's entire denominations? There's lots of people. Raphael Warnock, the guy that was elected as a senator from Georgia, he's pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the church that Martin Luther used to pastor. And he is trying to use the Bible to say it is, uh, abortion is correct. Homosexuality is correct. He's a reverend, only in his own mind. I don't revere the guy. And he's trying to use the Bible. That's a total perversion because they believe that the Bible is moldable. You have to interpret it in the light of what our society is doing. You know what that is? That's idolatry. They're making God in their image. 
They're saying, God, here's the way I think you ought to be. I think you ought to be like this, not take the revealed word and what God says about himself, but instead we're going to make God in our image. We're going to make him conform to what we want. That's idolatry. It's idolatry the way people are approaching the word and coming against it. And then for a senator to say the Bible has no bearing on the deliberations of this chamber. That person should be tarred and feathered, (laughs) run out of town. And some of you are thinking, well, that's not love. See, you don't know what the word says. That is love. It's love to stand up and say, this is what God's word says. And this is what our world says. And God's word is true. It's love to tell a person the truth. You know, I think I'm out of time, either that or they never started the clock. So uh, anyway, let me share one last thing with you here out of Leviticus chapter um, 19. And you know, in the New Testament, they asked Jesus, what is the great commandment in the uh, word of God? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And see the world, the, the ungodly have come out and they use these kind of, kind of scriptures to say, you ought to just love all of these people. Don't say, don't make anybody feel bad. If you put a cross up, that makes people that don't believe in the Bible uncomfortable. And that's not walking in love. If a person ever feels upset by you praying or something like that or reading a scripture, then somehow or another you aren't walking in love. And they'll quote, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Look at where that's quoted from. This is in Leviticus chapter 19 and in verse 18, it says, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's the verse that Jesus was quoting. And people take that and just apply it that love is just not ever making a person feel uncomfortable. Don't ever counter them. Don't ever say that what somebody is doing is wrong. Look at it in context. If you take a text Out of context, all you have left is a con. You've got to look at things in context. In the context, verse 17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. It is love to tell a person the truth. And if you don't tell a person the truth, when you see something destructive coming their way, you don't love them. You hate them is what this says. Don't hate them. Tell a person the truth. If you don't tell a person the truth, then it's only the truth that's going to set them free. If the church is silent in the face of all of the evil that's being pushed upon us today, You can say what you want to and say, well, I'm just trying to walk in love. What you're doing is loving yourself and you don't want the criticism and the rejection that would go with you standing up and speaking the truth. If you truly love a person, you'll tell them the truth even if they get upset with you. You'll tell a person the truth. You know, I was driving right up Highway 24 one time and down here in the pass, uh, a man at uh, Green Mountain Falls hit a horse and it was dark at night. It was foggy. You couldn't, you couldn't see from here to the back of this room. And this guy passed me. I saw his lights come on and then his car jerked. So I, I pulled up beside him and this guy was laying there and his windscreen had been uh, caved in and he was laying there in blood and I was trying to help him. And this horse was in the left lane. And as I was trying to help him, a suburban came around the corner and hit that horse going about 50 or 60 miles an hour. And it launched that Suburban in the air, five feet or I don't know something. It was high and about 20 feet. And this woman was able to regain control. I ran up there to see how she was and her head had made a bubble in the roof of her deal. And she was sitting there in pain. And then I...
heard other cars coming up the pass. And so I ran down the road and around the corner and I started jumping out in front of cars. They were going 50 and 60 miles an hour and flagging them down. And like I said, they could barely see me. And so some of the people didn't see me until the last minute. And they were slamming on their brakes. People were skidding. I heard people honk at me and yell at me and wave at me with one finger. And they were saying terrible things. But did you know when they got around the corner and saw what had happened, none of them ever came back and thanked me. Nobody ever came and helped me. And I I did that for over 20 minutes until the police arrived and started directing traffic. But I can guarantee you some of those people that probably hated me and felt uncomfortable by a man trying to flag them down late at night on a dark road. Some of them probably thanked God that I did it and saved their life. And that's an illustration. People today are destroying themselves. Hell is a real place. People are going to be going to hell. And Jesus said there's more people that go to hell by the broad gate than there are by the narrow gate. And people are, they're they're taking kids as young as four years old and giving them sex blockers and hormone blockers and doing transitional surgery on them. And there's actually a website I've seen that has thousands of people who have had transgender operations done on them who their life is totally ruined and now they are repentant of it. There's thousands of them that are saying, why did I ever do this? And we are trying to make this mandatory that if a kid just wants to say, I'm a girl or I'm a boy, and we're going to let a four-year-old d- decide something like that. If you allow that and don't stand up and say that this is wrong, you hate those people. You love yourself more than you love them. And I know that there's a lot of people, oh, oh man, you shouldn't be saying things like that. I'm telling you, there is a right and a wrong. There is truth and there is a lie. And there are lies that are being fostered on people today. And because I love people, I'm telling people the truth. And it causes some people to hate me. And I don't like people hating me. I wish that everybody loved me. But you know what? I love God more than I fear their rejection. And I'm going to say what God wants me to say. And I'm going to try and say it in love. I'm not against anybody. Man, I pray that all these people change, but I'm going to tell them the truth. And this is what we've got to do. We've got to recognize that the truth, God's word is truth. It's the absolute plumb line. It is the standard and the church has to stand up. You cannot count on Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden to speak the truth. They are not going to be speaking the truth. They are sold out to the devil. You have to stand up and speak the truth of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Some people, I can't believe you said that. Man, I remember when Trump said the MS-13 gang members, they're dogs and people just exploded. How could he say that? And I thought, well, Jesus said, go tell that old fox this. And he says, you're like a dog that returns to his vomit. You're a whited sepulcher. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. You scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. That was Jesus. And yet some people, well, we shouldn't do that. We ought to be Christian. We're trying to make us better than Jesus. A Christian means you're like Jesus. Jesus told people the truth. And when a Pharisee repented, Jairus repented, he healed his uh, daughter. And when Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a part of the Sanhedrin came to him, he treated him good, but he told the people the truth. I'm not saying you do it in hatred. Ephesians chapter four, verse 15 says we have to speak the truth in love. It's not love that sets people free. It's the truth that sets people free, but you have to speak the truth in love. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we need to be standard bearers of the truth. We need to stand and proclaim the truth. We can't count on the ungodly to do it. And so I just want to encourage you to make a commitment to God's word. Recognize that Satan, if he can't get you off of the word, he can't get you into sin. He can't destroy your life. He can't make you sick. He can't make you poor. 
unless you don't believe what the Word of God says. The Word of God will literally transform you, spirit, soul, and body. But you have to mix it with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, The Word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to believe it. And it has to be your revolution, revelation. And it'll cause a revolution. It has to be your revelation. And so you have to personalize it. Amen? Amen. So Father, we just receive this truth today, these things that I was talking about. We receive correction through the word of God. We recognize how Satan deceived Eve. And Father, we take a lesson from this and I say in the name of Jesus that we are going to exalt your word above anybody else's opinion. That we honor you more than we honor the woke culture, the cancel culture, the ungodly who are coming against the word of God on every angle. Father, we exalt the word and we make a commitment to know what your word says, to study it, meditate in it day and night, and then we will make our way prosperous and then we'll have good success. Father, we just make this commitment and I share these things with my brothers and sisters and for anybody who isn't absolutely committed to this and isn't dominated and controlled by the word of God. Father, I'm praying that you drop these truths into their heart and make this a part of their commitment is to honor you. Whatever you say, we just do it. Father, I thank you and I speak these things and I thank you that the Holy Spirit is changing people's lives right here. Thank you, Jesus. We agree and we receive it. You know, let me ask this before I let you go. And that is that if you have never made yourself a living sacrifice, which is what Romans 12, 1 says to do, and if you are still debating about whether or not you'll do what God tells you to do, then you haven't made Jesus absolute Lord. This doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, but you have to be willing to say, God, you are in control. And you may have to grow in your ability to understand, but you need to commit yourself. You need to run up a white flag. The scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that he is faithful and just to keep that which we commit unto him. If there's no committing, there's no keeping. He only keeps what you commit. You need to make a commitment. I remember, I can tell you exactly where I was when I made the decision to be a living sacrifice and crawl up on the altar and let God control my life. And none of us come out of the womb committed. You come out of the womb committed to yourself. You'll wake up the whole household in the middle of the night because you want something. You'll ruin a church service. You don't care. You don't know that anybody exists but you. We all came into this world completely committed to self and it has to be a choice to make a commitment to God to be a living sacrifice. So I'm just going to ask you, if you haven't done that, and please be honest and if other people start standing and say, I'm going to do it. And so you feel like, well, I better stand or what are people going to think about me? Then that means you're still committed to yourself. <laughs> you're worried about what people think about you. If you aren't willing to make that commitment, be honest enough to say, I'm not there yet. 
But if you've received what I've said, and if you say, man, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want God to literally dominate and control my life. And I haven't done that before. If that's you, I want you just to stand right where you are. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer, making in this commitment that I'm going to make Jesus the absolute Lord. I'm going to crawl up on the altar and become a living sacrifice. If that's you, just stand right now, wherever you are. Let me pray with you. I know this is short notice to make such a big decision, but if you feel God tugging you in that direction, just respond. Praise the Lord. And I know somebody's thinking, uh, could you have everybody bow their head and close their eyes so that people wouldn't see? I'm asking you to deny yourself. And having everybody close their eyes and bow their head would satisfy yourself. I'm, I'm wanting you to stand with everybody's head up and their eyes open so you get the maximum humiliation out of this. <laughs> I'm going to pray this won't work if you're seated. If you're going to receive this prayer, you got to stand in order to get this prayer. Anybody else? Praise God. I always get one or two off of that. You were going to bootleg this prayer. Father, we thank you and I pray for every person who's standing. And Father, we thank you for revealing the truth to us. Thank you for showing us that we haven't exalted you and exalted your word, that we are still leaning to our own understanding. Thank you for showing this. We know that you show this to us so that we can humble ourselves and receive. And so tonight we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. And we've humbled ourselves. We are standing and admitting that, Father, we have not given you absolute control of our life. And so we repent of that by standing. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we make a commitment to be a living sacrifice. We want you to control us. And Father, to the best of our ability, as we understand your leadership, we will do what you tell us to do, regardless of what that is. We just thank you and we make that commitment right now in the name of Jesus. And we believe you are faithful and just to keep that which we commit, that you will remind us of this, you will hold us to it. And thank you from this day forward, I think it's April the 7th, 2021. Our lives are now yours. And Father, we agree and we receive that and thank you in advance for the way that this is going to change people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Man, that's awesome. My life changed March the 23rd, 1968. You remember this date. And if you meant that with your whole heart, it's going to change you. I want to ask our prayer ministers, if they would, to come down front and maybe God has spoken to you. Maybe you prayed with me just now, but you just want somebody to specifically pray over one situation that you're dealing with. They're down here to pray with you. If you need healing in your body, if you're asking uh, prayer for wisdom about whether you're supposed to come, just any way that we can help you, all of these prayer ministers are here to help you. So if you need prayer for anything, they will be here to help you as long as you need it. Uh, sometime during this conference, we need to give an invitation for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That will jumpstart your life if you've never received the Holy Spirit and if you don't speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need power. So you can come down here and these people will pray with you and help you to receive that. Amen. Do we still have the cafe open tonight? Are you going to say, if you got something to say, all right, I'll turn it back over to Mike Pickett and let him come and give you some instruction. All right. My people are blessed tonight. Amen. That's awesome. So just to remind everybody that